Good evening, everyone. Um, today's speaker is Vivian Ming. She's a theoretical neuroscientist, technologist, entrepreneur, and author. So we'll be hearing from a lot. <laughs> she co-founded SOCOS, um, where machine learning and cognitive neuroscience are combined to maximize students' life outcomes. She's also developed a predictive model for diabetes to better manage glucose levels and um, systems to predict manic episodes in bipolar sufferers. Um, this was actually one of the reasons that I wanted to introduce her because um, I've always been interested in seeing how technology can do um, more aspects of social good, so um, I thought it was really cool that she was applying it to medicine. Um, previously, Vivian was a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley's Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, pursuing her research in cognitive neuroprosthetics, and she also spoke at TEDx Berkeley in 2017, so you might already be familiar with her. So, um, named as one of um, one of 10 women to watch in tech in 2013 by Inc. Magazine, please welcome Vivian Ming. All right. Um, this will be fun. If anyone, uh, just pure curiosity, has anyone ever actually seen me talk before? My apologies. Um, we won't be talking about the same things, but it will be the same stupid jokes, because that's how I roll. Um, but I give a lot of talks. Um, they used to be academic talks, because I used to be at the Redwood Center uh, here at UC Berkeley. And before that, I was at Stanford and CMU. Um, you know, getting my bona fides done and publishing, you know, papers and doing presentations at NIPS. And uh, I love being an academic. I think that if everything else in my life blew up, I could come right back here, get my lab set up again, and I'd be thrilled. The thing is, it turns out I don't really need to choose. I get to do whatever the hell I want to, which is pretty much the coolest job in the world. I'm a professional mad scientist. Uh, I just get to come up with crazy ideas and try them out and see if they work. Who pays for them? Well, a variety of people, but if no one else will, I get to pay for them because my life's been good to me. Um, do we commercialize them? Sometimes, but usually we just give them away because I don't need the money. Uh, and the world's better as a result. Uh, in the end, when I engage in a project, I don't think, is this a research experiment? Or is this a piece of public policy? Uh, am I doing something philanthropic? Am I starting a company? All I think is, will this make the world a better place? Uh, and it turns out, in a great many cases, um, it really is just me, by myself, doing my own thing. And uh, a lot of other people look at it, the work that I do, and think that it's weird and bizarre, uh, but the coolest thing in the world happens as a result of me being weird and bizarre, which is people are alive. I get to measure the impact of my days and how many people are alive at the end. It does make my days kind of hard to keep track of. I just flew back from Cape Town. I was giving a talk uh, down in South Africa. It's my 10th visit there in the last like five years. Uh, it's about a 60-hour round trip, uh, 22 hours flight to London or uh, Schiphol in Amsterdam, and then another well, t 11 hours, and then 11 hours down to Johannesburg or Cape Town, and then 11 hours back, and 11 plus you hang out. I know where all the best plugs in Heathrow Airport are. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly a hard life, right? I get to fly to one of the most beautiful places in the world from one of the most beautiful places in the world uh, and give a talk to a whole bunch of rich people uh, that, for whatever reason, are interested in what I have to say. Um, I fly on a bed that folds out on a plane, and they give me fancy meals. Uh, I really shouldn't complain about my life. Turns out it's one of the few things I'm really good at is complaining, so I complain about it anyways. But my life is, is really pretty amazing. Um, and everyone wants to know, though, when I fly there, so this most recent trip, I flew down, and I was there for 18 hours, and then I flew back. So a 60-hour trip, 18 hours on the ground. Uh, and the reason's really simple for me. I don't have any, I gave my talk. I met with the Mandela Foundation, and I met with Napster's foundation. This is a newspaper in South Africa that uh, invested in Alibaba when it was a pipe dream, and so now they're a multi-billion dollar business. 
Um, and uh, we schemed up some crazy ideas of things to try, and then I was done. And I don't really care about going to a museum or going to the top of Table Mountain or going on safari. I mean, they're very great. If you have a chance, go do it. I got back on the plane so I could get back here and either be with my family or get back to my work because that's what I love to do. Um, so I could take this talk in any number of ways. I have some prepared slides, but as the people of Cape Town discovered, actually, it was YPO, so the people from all around the world, um, sort of obscenely wealthy. Uh, it's interesting, YPO standing for Young President's Organization. I couldn't have told you that five years ago. Uh, nobody there is young. Uh, turns out CEOs don't tend to be young. Want to know, this is actual research, want to know what the, uh, if I took a photos of people and I had you all rate them for competence, I just take a random photos, you get 500 milliseconds. Is this person competent or not? Bam, bam, bam. Um, you're actually pretty good at it from the perspective that you agree about what makes a competent face. Uh, and if I took those ratings of those photos and, um, Unbeknownst to you, some of those people were CEOs and some of them weren't. Your ratings of competence are very predictive of who was a CEO and who wasn't. Uh, and amongst the people that are CEOs, some are CEOs of large public companies and some are CEOs of small private ones. And your ratings of their competence on a half a second judgment is predictive of who's the CEO of a big public company and who's the CEO of a small private one. Uh, interestingly enough, it is not remotely predictive of the performance of those businesses. So if you didn't know, the executive recruiting industry is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry, and we just explained 70% of its variance in a 200 millisecond, uh, 500 millisecond decision by just random people on the street. Uh, if you want to know, by the way, if you run this experiment in the United States, what that face looks like that gets the highest ratings, it's an older white male. Uh, it's maybe not so surprising. Um, uh, again, it probably doesn't correlate with anything we might call competence, but it is highly predictive of where people go in their lives. So I flew down to South Africa and I gave a talk. Uh, I don't even remember what it was about because I just tossed out the slides and um, I made up a talk on the spot. Turns out that's a lot more fun uh, than uh, giving a talk, some prepared talk. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, TEDx Berkeley. I gave an actual TED talk once. It's the only prepared talk that I've ever given. Uh, I had 10 minutes and like, you have to give them a script and stick to it and you do the performance and you gesture, you, like, you practice in front of a camera. Um, just ridiculous. So I went off script and they were not happy about that. Um, but it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to get up and explain to people something about the world that they don't understand. And I get to do it all the time. What's interesting is I don't have a social skill in my body. I, I have no instinct for networking. Uh, I am decidedly curmudgeonly. Uh, you may not want to ask me my opinion about blockchain, uh, given who the speaker is next week, but I will say it is the one technology in the world that I know of that is most desperately in need of an actual problem to solve. Um, uh, but it's, um, it's fascinating to be in this position to make a difference in people's lives. To have that be the deciding factor in how you go through life. What am I going to do today? How many, what can I do? Such that the most number of people will be alive at the other end. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating. So, um, that may sound like, not sound like it's going to be a talk about entrepreneurship, but it turns out along the way I've founded five companies. Um, actually, this uh, guy at YPO uh, didn't see my talk, but took me aside to have um, lunch afterwards and was just begging me to give capitalism a second chance, because I think he'd heard that I gave this talk about doing good in the world and therefore assumed that I was some sort of uh, dyed-in-the-wool uh, uh, socialist that wanted to tear down the banking system. Uh, a rather bizarre assumption, but it turns out people are full of assumptions all the time. So I founded five companies. I've been the founding executive at several others. Uh, one of them didn't go anywhere, but the others we either sold or are still 
alive today. Turns out I don't really like running companies. Uh, I like solving problems. So I take them to the point where a problem is solved, and then I hire actual adults to come run the thing so that I can go do more crazy mad science, because that's what I love to do. And in fact, about two years ago, I started thinking hard that um, I have built these companies, and I'm proud of what they do, but it takes time, and I feel like I'm not maximizing my impact by building a company. Uh, so what should I do? And a friend of mine said, well, you do all of these fascinating little projects. What if you founded like a think tank or an incubator? Well, you just take your mad science projects, you train other people how to do them, and you just do these things. And then, to paraphrase her and put it in a South African context, charge them like a wounded buffalo. Um, so I decided that I would take the first part of the advice and not the second. We founded this thing called Socos Labs, and that's what we do. We get calls. Um, my child has a life-threatening egg allergy. Please save their life. My child has 500 seizures a day. Please save their life. Or the Secretary General of the UN calls up and says, uh, our donors never give the full amount that they promise. What could you do to get them to make their commitments? Or Ericsson calls me up one day and says, we're sponsoring this UN project to unite orphan refugees with their extended family members. Could you do something with that? And we do. In every case, we take those projects, regardless of whether there's any budget or whatever a VC has said, or even if there's a good reason to think we could possibly make a difference, and we run our mad science experiments. And if we knew it would work, it wouldn't be science. And if anyone else was doing it, it wouldn't be mad. So we're always way out there on the edge. And yet, literally millions of people are alive. Uh, and in almost every case, I pay for everything, and we just give it away. I'm um, an intellectual venture capitalist. I'm investing in a future that I want to be a part of, that I want my kids to grow up in. Um, both I have a, an 11-year-old, uh, who you're going to hear a little bit about, and a 7-year-old. And they're amazing, and they're awesome. Um, in some ways, it's a little controversial to talk about in other parts of the world, but one of the cool things is they're mixed race, and here in Berkeley, and that's the single largest ethnic group. And it's cool. Uh, I love that. Uh, whereas um, in other places, I would be decidedly out of place, even though I get to travel around the world and be me, but I'm kind of a weirdo, whereas it isn't always the case for people that are different, that they feel like they can make an impact on the world, that they can actually offer something back. Um, so I've rambled enough as an introduction. I'm just trying to do a little level setting and give you a sense of uh, what I do. If you want to know one other thing about me that would be informative, it would be that, again, I get to give lots and lots of talks. The, talk which was most fun for me ever was to actually uh, give a talk at a science fiction conference. I love science fiction. Uh, amongst the various books um, that I'm writing right now, uh, there are now two screenplays and a piece of science fiction. Uh, actually, someone made a short film about my neuroscience work. And I never read anything about myself. I never read a news articles. I never watch my talks or interviews with me. Nothing, nothing, nothing. It's just there's nothing but madness in that direction. You end up like Elon Musk. So I um, instead, uh, so I'd never seen this, but this film festival calls me up and said, would you be willing to come to the festival and talk about this film? So I said, sure, I'm never going to watch it, but I'll come talk. I mean, it's my work. I know what I do. So I showed up and in two sessions answered people's questions about a film I've never seen. Um, and at the one of, after one of them, uh, this guy walks up to me afterwards and says, um, so Dr. Ming, have you ever consulted on movies? And I'm a native Californian, so I know what he means. As far as I can tell, in fact, the only reason to be faculty member at UCLA or USC is to consult on movies. So um, I said, oh, I've never done it, but I'd be happy to help if there was something I could do. And he said, oh, well, my name is Darren Aronofsky, and I'd really like it if you could help me with some movies I'm working on. Um, not exactly the direction I thought my life would go, but uh, we showed up at his production office uh, a couple months later in, in um, Brooklyn, and he just says, so I've got a, a, forget the movies, I've got an HBO deal, what do you want to do? Uh, so life gets weird 
and the funny thing about that is it was completely out of the blue. And you might think, random chance, this is how life works. And it does. One of the single, uh, one of my favorite papers of all time uh, goes by the title of an experimental analysis of inequality and unpredictability in artificial online markets, something like that. It's good enough that you could Google it. Um, so this was a science paper from uh, several years ago. And what they did is they paired with an actual new music site. And unbeknownst to the people visiting the site, they were signed up for one of nine virtual worlds. In the first world, you showed up at the site, and you saw a random array of songs to choose from with no ratings from anyone. You picked a song, and you gave it your own rating. And then you uh, picked another song, moved on. And this is new music. I mean, like, you've never heard of the bands, much less the songs. Then in the other eight virtual worlds, you saw the songs ordered by and with the average rating of the people in your virtual world. Again, you didn't know that that's what was going on. You thought it was everyone's rating. Um, so they found three things. First, there really is good and bad music. So the people in the independent world where they didn't see anyone's rating, if three people thought a song was good, they gave it a seven, which would be a very high score in that world, um, the fourth person probably gives it a high score as well. Uh, similarly, low scores, threes and fours. It's not a huge effect, but there's definitely this nice, linear, good, bad music trend. Uh, and people agree independently. As soon as you see other people's scores, finding two, bam, big nonlinear effects. The best songs become tens, which means, of course, all the variance disappears. Everyone's giving it a ten. The worst songs become zeros. And the stuff in the middle, people stop listening to. So you get this big, flat, nonlinear effect. Uh, whatever. So people are weird and were subject to social. There was just a paper recently showing that about 12 to 13 years old, literally our perceptions of the world change based on what people around us say. Our, you know, the old, is this dress green or yellow or whatever? Um, literal perception of color changes as a result of the opinions of people around you. So, um, so we're not so shocked that people are changing their ratings. Um, but, you know, I, I do fancy, smancy machine learning stuff, so it's a nonlinear system. Surely it preserves the cardinality of the ratings. We could just squash that back to its original scores, right? But here's the actual finding of the paper, which is that across those eight virtual worlds, we had all those different people interacting. No song that got the nonlinear boost in one world got it in any other. In other words, if you reran reality, then, well, I guess if you reran reality, maybe Michael Jackson wasn't a pedophile. But the other thing is, he also was an also ran, who had some good songs in the 70s, and then we never heard from him again. Uh, famous movie star, uh, the economic outcomes of large countries, the uh, performance of musicians or writers or even scientists, I guarantee you, citations for scientists should follow the same effect. You have to be good to be great. After that, it's a little bit of a coin toss. So maybe that was all that was going on with me. Some famous Hollywood director just happened to be there, and I just happened to be there, and he liked my rambling nonsense. Uh, he is, in fact, well-versed at the artistic expression of rambling nonsense. And so, wow, we're totally in synergy, and he comes and asks if I want to work on something. Um, but it turns out it's not chance. Part of what I'm going to argue here today is I do my work for a purpose. Uh, that purpose has nothing to do with whether a VC will fund my companies. It has nothing to do with whether it will make me any money. It has nothing to do with what other people think of me. Not that I don't care, but I make a supreme effort never to even find out. It has to do with whether I'm doing what I think is right. And one of the great paradox of purpose is that the people that follow a strong purpose actually end up earning more money. Uh, they live longer. They walk faster when they're 65. They have more friends. It doesn't apply here, but um, they uh, literally live longer. So it's kind of funny uh, because I was able to analyze 
the behavioral measures of purpose. So I use artificial intelligence to observe people doing whatever they're doing. We call it naturalistic assessment. I don't like running surveys or doing experiments. It's fine, but don't really have to nowadays. One of those NIPS papers I mentioned, we built what we called listen bots, and we listened to university students talk to each other on online. Pardon me, that was gross. And um, Euro. Um, so I, um, we listened to them online, and it turns out we knew at week one what grade they would get just for them talking about the course material. By week three, we were outperforming the final exam and understanding how they'd perform in the class. So it was cool, and again, it was a nice paper to publish. Uh, but in doing this sort of work, we discovered this really interesting thing. You could measure stuff that feels unmeasurable. Does someone have a strong sense of purpose? Is someone highly resilient? They have good perspective-taking skills or analogical reasoning. Turns out we could build models that could give us hard numbers around that sort of thing just by observing people living their lives. You want to know the single best behavioral measure of purpose is sacrifice. If I see evidence of you making a sacrifice for something that is bigger than you, a sacrifice which you will never directly recoup from, that is um, something that's going to take longer than a lifetime to play out. You make a sacrifice. So think about the paradox from that perspective. Purpose is defined by people taking a step back. And yet, over the course of their life, they end up farther forward. Um, I find myself in front of a whole lot of audiences that are obsessed with how much money they're making. They're obsessed with out-competing their classmates, the person sitting next to them, the person across the street, the startup in their space. Or my opinion is, your startup's better than mine? How can I help? All I care about is solving the problem. Uh, I can't say that my VCs have always been thrilled with that attitude, but it turns out I've been a lot more successful than most people have. And I think it's fundamentally because I'm not doing it for me. So I'm going to, at the end of this, I'll tell you sort of how I stumbled into this perspective, apart from the sort of science-y talk around it. And instead, uh, maybe I'll launch into some of the slides I was talking about to justify my existence. Um, all right, you already know a little bit about me, probably more than you ever wanted to, and I apologize for that. Uh, I have to say the thing that I'm most interested in is neuroprosthetics. Um, can I literally jam things in your brain and make you smarter? And the answer is unambiguously yes. So if you want to volunteer, uh, go for it. I think it would be awesome. The survival rates aren't super duper high, but um, for those of you that do survive, I will have a data point. Um, uh, by the way, the CRISPR thing, I, it is unbelievable. Does anyone know that the gene that they edited has to do with HIV, uh, and that's the story? Turns out it's also well known that it is related to cognitive development. Uh, I mean, really well known that that gene is related to cognitive development. No one was editing for HIV. Want to know why people are interested in genetic engineering is the same reason I'm interested in neuroprosthetics. I want to make smarter people. Ultimately, why do you think the two biggest funders in space are DARPA and the Chinese military? So, um, but I love this sort of stuff. I love it not because I'm completely devoid of any care about how it gets applied. I love it because I want to live in the world where it gets used correctly. So here's a, a, just a glance at a couple of projects we're working on. Um, instead of really talking in any detail about them, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of new projects I'm working on right now. Uh, and you can think about how they might, um, they might get commercialized. I admit, I don't particularly care, but uh, that's because I am now at a certain point in my life that I get to be very indulgent. But when I got my start, I had to care about all this stuff back then. Um, but just to cover a little bit, for example, uh, that heat map of Manhattan that was the bipolar project. Uh, let's just give you a sense of where each of these came from. Total serendipity. I was um, 
One evening, I was meeting with someone uh, near Madison Square Garden. She took me out to dinner. She was pitching me a startup idea. I don't even really remember what it was. I get pitched lots of ideas. Like People think I'm going to invest in their companies. I donate all of my money every year. I don't have anything to invest in anyone's company. Um, besides, it always fails. Company, you have to hit such a phenomenal home run for an early small scale investor to actually make any meaningful money back. So, um, but we had this fun uh, conversation, and at the end, she was walking out the door and she says back over her shoulder, you know what, I would forget it all if you could figure out how to fix bipolar. I don't know why, I don't know the context. Is it her, is it a parent, a, a loved one? Um, I have no idea. All I know is I was hooked. So I didn't go to sleep that night. I spent the whole night reading papers about manic depression, bipolar disorder. And um, I, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm not that kind of neuroscientist. I, I, the whole reason I became a theoretical neuroscientist, if you don't know what that is, we build machine learning to study the brain and we come up with better algorithms by studying the brain. The real reason we do it is because brains are messy and bloody and yicky and it's just really cooler to build a fake brain on a computer. So we think of all of the actual neuroscientists as being stupid and they think we're all lazy and we're both kind of right. Um, so uh, so I, I didn't know that much detail. I certainly don't know about, a lot about neuropharmacology and, and um, so I started studying and I came across this paper that said, hey, you know, if you take people with a genetic predisposition for manic depression, and, but they've never had an episode, they are not symptomatic at all, and you bring them into a clinic every week and run a big battery of tests on them, things like a tilt table test, they're meant to trigger responses, you can see behavioral evidence of their first ever manic episode six to eight weeks before it happens. And I thought, wow, that was really interesting, right? Remember, I make these naturalistic assessment systems. Could I build something into a phone, just randomly for all of you? And if you were headed towards a manic episode, it could say something? Well, then serendipity stepped in. The next day, uh, I was being pitched uh, by another startup, um, in this case, funded and everything, and they were asking me to join their board. And they were building a system to use mobile phones to passively track people's mood states in real time. And you can imagine this was, I don't know what, seven years ago, and back then, you know, maybe we could sell ads against it, maybe we could play music against it, all sorts of things that I really don't care about. In fact, the one thing I can say is I have zero interest in selling ads to anybody, um, but I, I was intrigued. I talked them into focusing on market research, at least it seems like an interesting field of doing some study. You know, how does this person feel before they got on a plane to Cape Town? How do they feel when they get off the plane to Cape Town? How much of a difference did our experience make? Um, and so I did this, and then I said, you know what, I don't want a piece of the company, because again, it's never gonna pay off. Uh, it's nothing against them, they were super nice and motivated guys, but startups just don't pay off. Please, don't build a startup because you want to get rich. It's like the lottery. Uh, that's not a particularly rational reason to do a startup. Um, but I was intrigued. So I said, here is my ask. It's not about money. You're going to give me all of your data, and we're going to build a system to predict manic episodes. And in fact, I was right. The company went out of business. They could never quite figure out how to monetize what they'd built. But we did build that system. It could passively, particularly based on the GPS, gyroscope, accelerometer movement data, could predict manic episodes by three to four weeks. 25% of severe sufferers would go on to kill themselves. And three to four weeks beforehand, we could let them know. We could let their doctor know. We could let their wife or their sister or a, a child know, hey, this person is heading towards a manic episode. What could you do about that? It's mad science. Nobody knows because no one's ever done it before. We're still figuring that out. And we gave it away. I think Johnson & Johnson is building an advanced version of that uh, for a system. Um, all I know is if nothing else, you could get a note three weeks ahead of time saying, your brother has a high probability of a manic episode in the next three weeks. Maybe he should take some time off from work or check in with his doctor. 
instead of a note taped to the front door that says, please call 911 and don't come inside. I don't want you to see me this way, which is the way most siblings find out. Wouldn't that be better? So we built this thing and it still exists. The company doesn't, but that does. It did way more good than a company doing mood-based market research ever would have. And I never made a dime off of it, other than occasionally giving talks, and then I give all that money away anyways. Um, but the world's better for that work, and that's actually all that matters. Uh, so that's one. You can see the woman smiling there. It's going in real time. Every one of those has a good story behind it, so I'm going to indulge. Uh, that was my undergraduate. It was my first ever machine learning project. I was an undergrad at UC San Diego. I'm going to actually go into tell that story in a little bit. But uh, I thought I was, back then, I thought I was going to be a wet neuroscientist. You don't stick wires into cat brains. And um, took my first ever and only programming course. And uh, the professor uh, recommended me to be a lab assistant at this place called the Machine Perception Lab that had a contract with the CIA to do real-time lie detection off of raw video. So it's a little morally great, but it was cool as hell. Uh, we got to build these things, and they learned on their own 20 years ago, way before deep neural networks. Um, and actually, Jeff Hidden got his start at UC San Diego. Uh, so, um, so we did this thing, and it was pretty difficult 20 years ago. Um, but since then, I've got to spin off a bunch of other projects. So for example, the one right next to it, this faces, uh, what you're seeing there actually is an early prototype version of a neural, deep neural network. It's learning not just about face categories, but about how people perceive faces. We built this sleazy little game called Sexy Face, and people would play, play it. And our promise was, for free, we'll find everyone on Facebook, Facebook that thinks you're sexy, and for $5, we'll find everyone who thinks you're sexy. Uh, whatever, you got what I was saying there. Uh, it was all a scam, which is to say a Trojan. People would play the game, and then it would confess, no, we're not actually truly awful people. Uh, it's just a mind reading game, keep playing. And after they played, they trained up the model for us. We tapped into this atrocious human behavior, and they then trained our model, and we were able to use it to reunite orphan refugees with extended family members by analyzing the UN's database of a million faces of little kids lost in refugee camps around the world, um, based on terrible, sleazy human behavior and funding from the CIA. And then that lab actually got bought. Uh, so they, they spun off as a startup um, and could never quite find their stride. This is one of the things I've certainly learned about startups. Don't build a platform company. Nobody wants to opt in to your startup platform. A platform is val valuable because it's a platform. A platform is valuable because a billion people are using it, or you have major corporate customers. Your startup idea as a platform is never going to go anywhere. Um, so they were trying to kick around. What is emotion recognition as a platform, as a product? And they couldn't quite get it. Deep neural networks come along. Their performance jumps way up. And then they have this clever idea. They did a real-time facial expression analysis of one of the like, 2015 Republican presidential debates. When there's like 157 people up on stage and everyone's wondering whether Ted Cruz actually has human emotions. Um, uh, and so they ran this in real time, simulcast on YouTube. Uh, an expression recognition analysis of the candidates while they're doing their thing. Literally, the next day, the bidding war starts between Facebook and Apple. So if anyone has an iPhone 10, all that face recognition technology, that's my old lab. Uh, and um, the Animojis, uh, which are not up there, but you know, you talk into the phone, and it like, animates a cat on the other end. There's an important lesson. We were talking about doing that 20 years ago. Uh, if you think you've got a new idea, you don't. It's about the execution of the idea that really matters. Um, but the funny thing is, uh, the lesson that tells about innovation. People think about innovation driving the world, innovation changing, innovation for good. The real rule you should take away from all of that is that tens of millions of dollars of CIA funding, 20 years worth of research, dozens of dissertations have ended up animating cats on your phone. 
Uh, in fact, that's what all innovation is in the end, is animating cats on the internet or on your phone. Uh, I don't care what you're doing. It could be blockchain. Uh, God forbid when the cats get into blockchain, it will be a mess. Um, so we get to do all these cool things. Uh, there's some neuroprosthetics over there on the side. Uh, the brain equalizer is a pretty crazed idea out there uh, that I'll skip over. Um, we run projects in education, in workforce, uh, health and mental health, in inclusion, anything involving people. I get a lot of fancy smancy job offers. Uh, Uber once uh, pinged me about being their chief scientist. Took me about three seconds to say, hell no. Um, back then, Travis was still involved, and the place was a cultural nightmare. Um, and listen, there's, I'm pretty clear why they would have wanted to hire me as one of their senior executives. Uh, the one that was fun, you already know a little bit about me, uh, director of algorithms in Netflix would have been cool. Uh, you know, getting to design the algorithms that decide who stars in their shows and what scripts to invest in and things like that, that would have been awesome. But it took me three minutes to think hard. How am I maximizing human potential? How am I making other people's lives better by recommending movies? Had to pass. The one job uh, invitation, let's call it, that I've ever considered, uh, Amazon uh, wrote me and said, uh, Dr. Ming, in seven years, we're going to be a one million person company. And your job will be to make their life better. That was it. That was the pitch. I would be the chief scientist for people. I get to Amazon as my mad science lab to do whatever I wanted to make their lives better. So I, for the first time ever, I actually went and visited. I'd done a lot of collaborative stuff with a lot of big tech companies. But I've never actually seriously considered a job with any of them. But I flew up to Seattle, met with everybody, and pretty quickly came to understand that Jeff's definition of better is different than mine. Now, I don't think he's a bad guy. Uh, I think his definition of better is based on a core idea that people don't change. My fundamental belief, driven by some massive data sets, is not only can everyone change, everyone's already amazing. They just vanish, and the few of us will ever get to life, live a life that allows us to actually express that. So when I look at the opportunity to take a million people's lives to make them better, I looked at it as an opportunity to grab a million people. Or maybe if we split it up, think about the logistics operation, the warehousing, and so forth. About 800,000 of those people would probably be on that side of the business. So that's 800,000 people. For two years, I get a chance to grab them and pull them into the creative economy. You know, to say, hey, this is how you are amazing. And I'm sure you didn't expect to spend the rest of your life living, working in a warehouse. And guess what? Amazon doesn't even want you to spend two, more than two years working in their warehouse. Literally, one of my jobs would have made them happily want to leave after two years, um, which I'm quite confident I could have done. But I have zero interest in. What a waste. What a waste of human potential. Uh, what a waste of a world that is so fully connected that not tapping into the most that people can give means you're robbing from yourself. But if Jeff is right and people can't change, then they're taking a rational approach. Why be stuck in a job you're going to hate? They don't, they're like virulently anti-union. I'm meeting with their director of research and algorithms there, and he's like halfway through, we're talking about some NIPS papers, and he's like, so you know we don't really like unions here. I'm like, what the, what were we just talking about? Um, you can have your own feelings about unions, but that was a bit of a strange break in the conversation. So in the end, I didn't say no. I said, listen, if I can make a million people's lives better, I'll do it for free. I don't really need the money. Call me a fellow, give me all the same data, and I will do what I think is right, only in the service of Amazon. We'll publish some papers, but we build stuff only for Amazon. And they turned me down. Uh, it's not really that surprising. There's only one job description at Amazon to do what Jeff says, and clearly that's worked pretty well for them. He probably should have taken that advice recently. Um, uh, I, I, I'm completely at a loss of why anyone wants to take a photo of their junk and send it to anybody, but um, I, has anyone ever been happy to receive such a photograph? Uh, ever? Um, so uh, so, uh, so I, we ended up walking away from that. 
Uh, and it sounds crazy. How could you walk away? That Uber job, good God, do you know how much money? Now they're about to go public? I don't know how much I would have come away with from there, but it's reasonable to assume it involved lots and lots of zeros. Took me three seconds. I have zero regrets about it. Um, the net result of someone's life isn't how much money they make. Go visit uh, Monaco sometime. Uh, if you're like me, it was my least favorite city in the world. Uh, gambling and all of the horriblenesses of the shallow signs of wealth. Um, uh, if anything, I think Monaco should sue Donald Trump for devaluing the brand value of gold. It's just obscene. So, um, so you know, this isn't me. I have to do what I think is right, not because I have something against capitalism, but because that's actually what makes me successful. The reason my life is so good, the reason I didn't need the money, uh, is because I was willing to walk away from it. Because had I ever taken one of those jobs, that would have been the end. I know it. I know that it's true. I'm not being courageous other than understanding that being me is the single best thing I can do, even for me. Uh, so I get to do all these cool projects. We have a couple of new ones where, um, keep your fingers crossed, this is taking astonishingly large time to get the board uh, to agree, but we are hopefully working with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. We're building a machine learning-based system that will help make a wish, help the kids make better wishes as measured by survival rates. Turns out, granting a wish to a dying child literally increases their likelihood of survival. So there's a couple of papers out about that. And we thought if that's true, then if we could use some of the cognitive modeling techniques that we've developed, then we should be able to target the right kind of wish. You want to go to Disneyland? Awesome. It's the number one wish and the number one sponsor of Make-A-Wish. Um, what if you brought your three best friends with you? So there's this neat evidence. It looks like for certain, not everyone, but for certain kinds of kids, making a wish more social increases their survival rates. You want to meet Chris Evans? Great, he's hunky. Um, but how about you and Captain America go fight that crime together? So as you probably, I don't know, you were all like 12 years old. So, um, but Bat Kid here in San Francisco several years ago, there was another one in Seattle. Uh, where these little kids went out and actually fought crime, and the, the reporters wrote up the stories like they really happened. It was just amazing. By the way, you can't go to a Make-A-Wish board meeting and come out either with a human soul or without tears. It's one or the other. Uh, it's brutal. But it's worthwhile. So we're building this thing. We have the full unanimous support of their... Um, their medical advisory board, I'll pay for everything. Amazingly, they still haven't approved the project because I just don't think that they believe that someone will do it for free. Um, so we'll just, we'll keep working on it and we'll have it ready and when they're ready, uh, we'll give it to them. Um, we're working on another project. So right there, this guy, it's actually, he was just over at Skydeck. Um, it's a small startup called Hum, originally based in Perth, talk about the middle of nowhere. Um, and they actually came out here uh, and they're building a uh, cognitive neuroprosthetic, a working memory neuroprosthetic. So I, a lot of my work involves looking at the factors that predict the best life outcomes. So I founded a couple of educational technology companies, and I mentioned one of them. We were able to outperform final exams and standardized tests. In fact, that was the whole point of the company, was, let's end all standardized tests. Um, we know they're biased. We know they don't actually predict much other than who goes on to the next level by design. So what if we could just obviate all of it and turn learning itself into the assessment? Uh, great, everyone loved it. I mean, we gave talks at the Department of Education. In fact, even ACT and the College Board came and invited me to give talks. Uh, the reason they were so blase about it is they knew something I didn't, which is the coolest technology in the world, the best idea, doesn't matter if no one actually wants to buy your product. So it turns out no one actually wants to end high-stakes testing. Everybody wants to talk about it ending it. Nobody wants to end it. It's like a big, uh, as they would call it in Mexico, completely normal standoff. Um, and where the parents and the schools and the companies and the testing company and the high schools, nobody wants to drop their gun. 
Nobody wants to be the first one that says no test. So uh, that was a hard thing to learn. But we built this amazing uh, technology. And then it was, I was rethinking, doing the post, the, the um, uh, autopsy on that startup. We ended up selling it to do something else. Um, what we understood was, I actually don't care whether people get good grades on tests or do well in their uh, grades. What I actually care about is they have a wonderful life. I care whether these kids will grow up to live longer, be happier, and have a bigger, more meaningful impact on the world. That's all I care about. In fact, that's the whole purpose of the education system. Anywhere in the world is that. The tests, the universities, everything else is just a mediator of those outcomes. So crazy mad science, right? How could you possibly predict where a four-year-old will go in their life? Anyone here ever heard of the, um, the marshmallow experiment? Couple? Uh, it's a very famous experiment. Um, I take a three-year-olds and four-year-olds, and I put a marshmallow in front of them, and I say, if you don't eat this, I'm going to be back in 10 minutes. If you don't eat the marshmallow, uh, I'll give you a second one. But if you do, you only get the one. And the original version of this marshmallow was just to figure out where something called executive control came online. I get the hint I'm supposed to shut the hell up soon. I haven't even really started my talk. Um, so, um, so when does executive control come on? It turns out three-year-olds eat the marshmallow every time. Four-year-olds don't. But it turns out there's this even more interesting effect. The four-year-olds wait a different amount of time before they eat the marshmallow. Some of them, you, like, you put the marshmallow in front of them, and you say, now I'm going to be, and then there's just like an empty spinning plate, like a cartoon, because uh, they're just um, And some of them will wait like 20 minutes. That's about as long as a little kid will wait. You will note that means the researchers waited 20 minutes after they told the kid that they would only do 10 minutes. So the, the experiment teaches these little kids uh, two incredibly terrible lessons about life. Uh, adults always lie, uh, and they like to do cruel things to you. Um, so every kid gets the second marshmallow, and they wait for every kid to break. But the ones that wait the longest before they break it's actually is a very robust, though controversial, predictor. Uh, it actually predicts university admissions, some of the variance in university admissions. It predicts some of the variance in lifetime income and in health outcomes. Well, so does working memory span. So I, we track 50 different constructs. And then somehow I magically wrap up what appears to be a nine-hour talk in the next five minutes. Um, we look at 50 different constructs, all of which are measurable using our various methodologies, are highly predictive, almost certainly causally related to long-term life outcomes. And they can be changed about people. Turns out, you really want to know what's going on in the marshmallow experiment? It's not that some kids have executive control and some don't. What's really going on in the, marking, the marshmallow experiment, you can do versions of this with adults as well, is do you believe your hard work is going to pay off? And I mean believe in a neuroscientist sense. Not like articulate it to me, but do you really believe? That is what predicts whether the kid will eat the marshmallow or not. In fact, you can run a little manipulative experiment ahead of time, vary whether the adult lied to them beforehand, uh, control for their background trust in adults. It predicts how long they wait. What's actually disturbing about the marshmallow experiment isn't that you know, the kids that take the shortest amount of time, like we should send them, teach them how to dig ditches, because that's all they'll do for the rest of their life. That's the total wrong takeaway. What's truly horrific about the marshmallow experiment is that by four years of old age, so many little kids have learned that it's not worth waiting. Um, that's terrible. But working memory span is another one. Hugely predictive of life outcomes, maybe not at an individual level, but at a population level. And uh, HUM developed a technology, uh, alternating current transcranial stimulation of the midline theta, that uh, literally you just flip a switch. You, anyone know the, the uh, Simon game, this old game with like lights and sounds, and you have to do a different length sequence? Most of you, you're above average in this room. I would be willing to guess. So you probably run more like six, seven, nine length, maybe six, seven, eight. I, I remember how to count. Um, so flip a switch, and you are now 8, 9, tens. So it increases working memory span by about 20%, literally with a flip of a switch. Working memory span is predictive of how long you live. 
It is predictive of how much money you make in your lifetime. It's predictive of how far you go in your education. Uh, increasing working memory span by 20% would be the equivalent of a population shift in lifetime earnings of about $30,000 a year. It'd be a huge impact on people's lives. That's not what they've invented. Uh, but still, it is, it's been on my website for 20 years. What if it was 20 plus or minus 2? So if any of you are cognitive scientists, that's a reference to the famous old, the very first paper on working memory scan, span, the magic number 7 plus or minus 2. What if we could just change that? And we can make the average person higher than the most exceptional genius you will ever come across. What would the world be like if that was true? I have no idea. No one could actually know. I know that they look at the rest of us like we have Down syndrome, but hey, that's life. Um, so what are we doing here? And then I will uh, shut up. Um, we, so I'm advising them, help get them some funding, uh, and uh, helping them do some of the statistics and develop out the technology. And in exchange, I get as much of that technology as I want. We're designing, running, and paying for an experiment with kids with traumatic brain injury. One of the most common symptoms of traumatic brain injury is loss of working memory span. They fell off their bike, they were abused, they were in a car accident, something that had no fault of their own, and their whole life story has been taken away. Can we put the pen back in their hand to write their own life story? Uh, so I was going to tell all these other stories, but instead I wasted my time with this stuff, uh, and I didn't even bother telling any dirty jokes. So that's probably disappointing. Well, um, um, Dr. Bing, maybe those will come out in questions, but we want to leave about 15 minutes for some Q&A, if that's all right. It's so That's great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up here. So I actually did give a TED Talk, uh, and go check it out. It's, uh, anyone know who that is, by the way? I always ask, like asking this question. Really, in Berkeley, uh, right? So Rodney Mullen, probably the greatest skateboarder of all time. Go see the TED Talk to know what it's about. Uh, if you're going to start a company, this is an incredibly important talk. Uh, it was originally titled The Fanatic, but it now goes under the title, because apparently that was controversial, the title of The Paradox of Incentive Insensitivity. And in that talk, I explain how we discovered that the best salespeople in the world don't care about their bonuses. And that's why they're the best, um, which is also true of the best software developers and everyone else. Uh, this is another one. I'm not going to explain what it is. I already talked a little bit about purpose, so you have a sense. One of my favorite definitions of purpose is uh, paraphrasing a famous old um, saying, the world gets better when old men plant trees. Right? When an old man plants a tree, he isn't going to be around to lie down under its shade. This is for someone else. You know, maybe not even for his grandkids. Uh, well, this is an actual old man. He's planting trees single-handedly on the edge of a desert in India to hold back the desert all by himself. And he's been doing it for decades. Uh, talk about acting with a purpose. He will never reap the benefit of what he's doing. Never. But he does it anyways. Um, this is fun. So that's me. Uh, and anyone that doesn't know my history, so uh, I gave a talk. I was actually, so I was at UC San Diego. I will just take a moment and share this little bit of my story. Um, so when I was a little kid, I was supposed to win a Nobel Prize. I don't mean that in the sense that my parents were like dragon parents and they were, you know, you will practice violin every day. Um, it just was supposed to happen, just period. I'm supposed to win a Nobel Prize. Somehow I was also supposed to be a kicker in the NFL. I don't know how those two things were going to work out at the same time, but it was going to happen, and it was just expected. And the more I tried to be that person, the worse things got. Uh, everyone knew I was smart, but the more I tried to be a smart kid, the worse I did, and the more unhappy I became. Uh, and the more unhappy I became, the worse I performed, and then I felt like I was letting everyone down. And by the time I reached high school, I was, if it wasn't, ironically, for standardized tests, I'd have washed out entirely. Uh, I would typically fail all of my classes right into the last week and then scrape by by acing up the exam. And then um, I went to university uh, in 1989, which I know is so long ago uh, that all of you are scoffing at the idea that such a date existed. But Fuck you. So, um, and I, uh, I almost immediately flunked out and then ended up homeless for many years. 
so I was trying to figure out, uh, living in my car, and I had a gun, because it's America, and, um, and I spent a night in 1995, and again, fuck you, um, trying to figure out why I should be alive. I'd never done anything worthwhile. I'd only ever let people down. What's the point? Not a cry for help. Trust me, this is just euthanasia. Life was awful, and I was the main reason it was awful. So why not fix that? So it turns out the only two people left in my life were my parents, and I didn't want to hurt them. So I needed to come up with a reason to be alive. And now, years later, I can look back on that and see that I found a purpose. Or more accurately in the scientific literature, uh, I developed construct strength of purpose. Turns out it doesn't really matter what the purpose is, as long as it's bigger than you and you won't complete it in your lifetime. So the purpose I walked into backwards at the point of a gun that I was holding was live a life that makes other people's lives better. Um, maximize human potential, as my marketing team once put it. And magically, my life was fixed. Of course not. I was living in my car. It took five years to crawl back out of that hole. But I did, because now I didn't care anymore. The lesson I learned that night was that it wasn't about me, and it wasn't about my happiness. It was about whether I was serving my purpose. In my case, it's a very grounded humanist purpose. But if it's a spiritual one for you, that's fine. I don't know that Manchester United counts as a purpose, but find something that carries you through. Everyone has to have a purpose. If you can't find yours, there's a whole list of people that want to sell you a purpose. Uh, one of them is this orange gnome in the White House, and, or it's Boko Haram, or it's whoever. They, they got purpose. The world's overflowing with purpose for you. What's actually important is that you build your own, that you are the kind of purpose, the kind of person that can see what it is that moves you. And the cool thing about it is, and this comes right out of the research, it isn't something, there isn't one thing you're meant to do in this world. And it isn't something you have to go find. You get to build it tonight. You don't have to wait at all. Construct your own purpose. That's what the research shows clearly. So I, um, I went back to school, back to UC San Diego, 10 years later. Uh, where I'd flunked out previously, and I did my whole undergraduate degree in a single year, and I got perfect scores in every class. And then I went and did my PhDs at Carnegie Mellon, and then I was at Stanford, and then I started, I was here, and I started a bunch of companies. Um, what it took for me to be successful is I had to let go of it all and not give a goddamn what anyone cared, except what I believed was right. Um, I needed to learn how to serve my purpose. And it served me incredibly well since then. One of the steps along the line was realizing that I didn't want to be that little boy anymore. Uh, and about 12 years ago, I went, actually, right here at UC Berkeley. I went through gender transition. Pure aside, first day I ever showed up as me in my own lab. It was the last day anyone ever asked me a math question. Um, a little disturbing. Those of you guys in the room that wonder if the girls have it differently, um, yeah, yeah, it's very different. Uh, it's, it's sometimes obnoxiously different. Like the time a VC patted me on the head and told me I should be so proud of what I built. Um, I've always wanted to track that guy down since and kick him in the balls. Um, but uh, so what it really should say is just fucking die already. Just get it over with. Set an end date. You guys want to start a company? Great. You've got three years or five years, whatever it is, pick a date. As soon as you actually get great at that, die and start over again. And then die and start over again. I've been a scientist and an entrepreneur. I've been a writer and a speaker. I've been a man and a woman. I've been all these different things. Every time I change, I get better. I have a purpose. Every one of my lives is a lesson in how to do it better. Every one of them counted. And they count for something. But I never dwell on any of them. Saturday morning breakfast cereal? Anyone a fan? Dirty jokes for physicists? This is not my crowd. Uh, go check it out. It's very funny. Uh, but this is one of the ones, and I will finish with this, that I really liked. Uh, every now and then, he gets a little philosophical, and this is one of the ones. Here's something that's true. One day, you will be dead. Here's something false. You only live once. It takes about seven years to master something. Eh, the truth is the science is a little more complex than that, but the spirit is true. 
Uh, therefore, starting at age 11, if you live to be 88, you have 11 opportunities to be truly great at something. These are your lifetimes. Um, when I first read this, it just incredibly resonated with me. Uh, I'd already gone through gender transition. I'd already led completely different lives. Uh, and he goes on to detail people that just didn't get it. Um, and uh, boy, I understand all of them, because I've been there. I always, but this is my favorite panel of the whole bunch. Two years till I die. I wonder what I'm gonna do next. I said that once when I was the chief scientist of one of the first companies ever doing um, AI for hiring. And my CEO was sitting next to me and I caught out of the corner of his eye like, oh shit, we're supposed to IPO in two years. Um, uh, so, but this is it. This is how I go through everything. Soon as I get great at something, I'm out. Not because I don't care, but because we've already made it happen. And I have no desire to coast. I don't need the money. I don't even want it. I want to go make another difference. Um, so spend a lifetime writing poems. Spend another building things. Uh, spend a life looking for facts. Spend another looking for truth. These are your lifetimes. I know you feel very early. It feels like it's already been a lifetime. It hasn't been anything. Nothing you've done. I'm not saying your life to date hasn't mattered, but I know, because I can remember, and because it never goes away, it feels like the next decision you make will be the single most important decision forever. Your whole life will be set as a result, and you will never be able to recover if you make a bad one. Boy, did I make some bad decisions. And my life is as superlatively good as most people can imagine. Uh, and it isn't because I'm special. Anyone can do the work that I do. In fact, that's what drives me is that very thought. The kid that is gonna come up with the cure for my child's disease was just born in a favela in Rio, or in a shanty outside Cape Town, or just down the street in Oakland, and they will never have the chance to live that life, and I will suffer as a result. How insane is it to not believe in the potential of other people? It's incredibly insane. Go read research by Raj Chetty. He'll win a Nobel Prize someday, unless it turns out he's been hitting on all of his female grad students. Um, that was nervous laughter. Uh, so, uh, um, but he is an amazing guy, and he runs this phenomenal research, uh, and he, uh, he has this great stuff. So go read it, um, especially the stuff about lost Einsteins. Um, so you have this opportunity to, to live all these lives, and you're so early on. Nothing you can do will take you so off track that you can't come back and do an amazing thing in the next life. Whatever you're doing, go all in. Build your own purpose and just fucking die already. Because the greatest thing you will ever do in your life is plant a tree. And you don't need to wait. You don't have to wait for a VC to fund your tree. You don't have to wait for your board to approve your tree. You don't have to wait till you've mastered uh, arboreal arts and, God, everyone wants someone, people to learn how to program nowadays. What terrible career advice. If in 10 years anyone's programming, I will be shocked. Um, so um, you just get to go do it tonight. You get to do that. And I'm begging you, every one of these lives is a chance to go and plant a tree and I hope that you have the chance to use that life wisely. So thank you very much. I'll answer some questions. Dr. Ming, I, I said, I told the class you'd be exceptional, and you are exceptional. I think we are going to ask um, students to do a feedback survey, but I'm going to, if it's okay with you, ask students to come up to you one on one and ask their questions. They'll yeah, I did a down. terrible job about leaving time for questions, you know, but I, I think that we can do. If this. anyone needs to take off uh, and do the survey, and then do what you need to do, but I am happy to hang out here for a little while. It's the I, again, I love social networking, but I love talking about my work. It's the paradox of me, which is, I think I'm a pretty ridiculous figure, 
but I am phenomenally passionate about the work that I do. So anyone wants to ask questions? Uh, anyone wants to pitch me a blockchain company? Please come up and do it. Uh, I promise I'll be gentle. All right, thanks. <laughs>